Good morning, everyone. I am Noelle McClooney, and I will be presenting service today along with uh, Lou Hubert. Robin Perry and Kevin McClooney are providing technical assistance. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. Uh, we are glad that we can keep in touch and support our community, even if we can't be together in person. Please be aware we are recording this service and it will be posted on our Facebook and YouTube pages. We gather today to foster our understanding of our place in the universe, embracing the worth and dignity of all, supporting justice, equity, and peace in our world, accepting one another as we search for meaning and respecting the connectedness of life. Please take a moment to think of all your friends at MBUC. Uh, greet them with a comment in the chat box and remember that you can still reach out to them via email, phone, social media, or video chat. Physical distancing does not need to mean emotional distancing. Let us support one another. Visitors, as we are a diverse group with varying interests and beliefs, our services are varied in format, tone, and topic. We encourage you to view several services to gain a good understanding of our congregation. If you'd like to receive our weekly email newsletter, please email us at news at mbuc.org. MBUC reminds, uh, remains committed to supporting our members and friends during this difficult time of social distancing. For that reason, we are coordinating assistance with groceries, phone calls, and other needs. If this sounds like something you would be help, that would be helpful to you, please send an email to sac at mbuc.org with your name and what kind of assistance you would like to request. Now is the time for announcements. Announcements can be sent ahead of time to services at mbuc.org to be read. Um, if you have an important announcement now, you can raise your hand by clicking the raise hand button at the bottom of the participant box in Zoom. Then we will announce your name and turn on your mic and camera so you can make the announcement yourself. Robin, are there any announcements today? There are currently no announcements in the services email, but I will wait to see if anyone posts anything in the chat box or raises their hand. Oh, Megan says she has an announcement, so I am going to ask her to unmute and Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to remind folks that today is the first day of our uh, collection drive of food and hygiene items for the Brown Bag Food Project. I will be at the MVUUC building from 1 to 2 p.m. today. Um, so you can just drop off your donations and I'll be there to just bring them into the church. I will also be there next Sunday, January 17th from 1 to 2 p.m. doing the same thing. And all of the donations will be uh, dropped off to the Brown Bag Food Project um, uh, <laughs> next Sunday. So this actually coincides very well with um, the, the Brown Bag Food Project's Martin Luther King weekend uh, food drive, their annual food drive, they're doing it virtually this year. So we'll be actually uh, able to contribute to that. Um, so again, bring your donations to uh, the church building either today from 1 to 2 p.m. or next Sunday, 1 to 2 p.m. And I will put a link in the chat box of the list of requested items from Brown Bag. Yes, so Kay, I will be posting that immediately. Thank you, everyone. Are there any other announcements? I'm curious how the blood drive went. Lisa? <laughs> All right, uh, we'll move on. All right, chalice lighting. Um, the chalice will be lit today by me. <laughs> Please join me in reading the words for the chalice lighting that appear as a comment in the chat box. Mindful of both past and present, we light this candle in memory and hope.
And now we'll help him. You know, it's been um, it's been an amazing week, uh, and if we think about what happened on our way to Sunday, uh, it's hard not to uh, reflect on what we've all witnessed this week, what we've all seen, and it's going to be watched and remembered and witnessed uh, as a sad chapter in American history as we watched it all unfold at the U.S. Capitol on Wednesday, and uh, it's going to be with us for a long time to come. There's no doubt about it. Um, and rather than pontificate on a lot of the big questions that will emerge and the questions that I'm sure most of you have, um, we're going to get plenty of that in the days and the weeks to come. So I just wanted to talk a little bit uh, at this point about my personal reaction uh, as I watched all of that uh, unfold. Uh, back in 1969, uh, I took my first trip to Washington, D.C. I was just a I was a young, wet behind the ears guy of 19 years old, took a trip to Washington, DC. Having been a history nerd, uh, even at a young age, I you know, walked around, saw the sights. It was a beautiful, warm spring. In fact, it was the first week of April, if I recall, and the cherry blossoms were out. And it was a, it was a gorgeous time to be in Washington. And uh, it was my first experience there. And I remember, you know, visiting some of the buildings and going through the, the Capitol building and, and, and being in awe, quite frankly, of, of that building and, and what it meant and what it meant uh, historically to our, to our country, uh, generally filled with a, with a, with a sense of, of pride. Uh, later that day, I found a park bench um, nearby someplace probably by the Capitol. I remember just looking at the, the dome and, and, uh, and jotting down a, a couple of notes about how I felt at that moment about the, the city and the Capitol and how it had sort of filled my heart with a sense of, of history, uh, a sense of knowing that I was walking in an area uh, in, the, in the shadow of giants, if you will, uh, that had been there long before us and Jefferson and Madison and Adams and Washington and Lincoln and FDR and, and the, the great names of history that we all studied and knew about as kids. And here I was, this dumb kid from Genoa, 19 years old, uh, walking in the footsteps of, of those giants and being at least uh, what I felt that you know, the, the, the presence when you feel uh, that uh, was palpable for me that day and I've, I've never forgotten it. And this week on Wednesday, as I watched this ragtag band of rabble, uh, this confederacy of dunces, if you will, vandalize and deface this most sacred temple of democracy in our nation's capital, I couldn't help but wonder if any of them felt that same sense that I felt so many years ago, that if they really understood, if they really felt that sense of history, that what that building represented, what it symbolized is, is probably one of the, the world's most successful democracies, if not the most successful democracy in the history of the world, and I wondered if they understood that this was more than just a, a, a prank, that this was not just a prank, if this was, this was a crime against history. This was, a, this was a crime against us as a people. I don't know. I don't know what they felt. I, I, I can't figure out uh, what they were maybe feeling inside. But if I was inspired by anything after this was over, I was inspired by the fact that so many others who were not a part of this siege on America, like maybe you and I sitting in our living rooms across America who watched in horror as it unfolded, that we felt that same sense of sadness, the same sense of something being, something sacred being taken away from us, that anger and that outrage, because we care about our past. We care about the ideals and the values that the past represents and what our history represents. And as long as we care, as long as we care, and I think we do, and I think that's been demonstrated so far in the days that followed, then I take some inspiration and I wanna take some, a positive note from that, that we're gonna get through this crucible of craziness right now, and we probably will emerge stronger. At least that's what I hope. And that's what I hope is one of our rhymes of history, if you will. Thanks.
inspiring to say the least. Um, you know, a lot of you know, or maybe you don't, uh, years ago, I wrote a book called Day by Day in Toledo. And one of the things that, uh, that, I, that I wanted to do in doing that was to sort of, we take a look at history uh, on what happened on a particular day in history. Now, we're, we're going to remember January 6th, probably for a long time. That will be a, a day that will live in our infamy. But just sometimes the regular day to day, what, what happens in the regular day to day of, of life? And how important is that? And, and what is it that sometimes it's that day to day of life that really represents what we're all, all about, those sort of slices of our, of our individual lives. So what I've done is with day by day is I took each day and I, and I tried to sort of document what happened on that day in history locally in Northwest Ohio and Toledo and Southeast Michigan and what we were all about and, and not just nationally, but locally as well. Um, but I thought I'd try something different today and talk about, take one, the first week or so of January and just take a look at what was life like a hundred years ago in 1921, what were our what were our grandparents or our parents? What were their day to day lives? What were they like? And what problems were they facing? What were their concerns? Anything like we're dealing with today? And uh, tr going back through some newspapers and trying to read the tea leaves on on that and gleaning as much as I could, I tried to put together at least that and see if there are any any rhymes of, of history. Now, I have to tell you, when we started, when I st started looking at this, I forgot all about it. They said the, the New Year's Day of 1921, 100 years ago this past week, New Year's Day was the quietest day in the history of Toledo and maybe the country. And why was that? It was because we were actually in our second full year of prohibition and there were no liquor stores that were open. There were no saloons, ostensibly, that were open. Uh, and quite frankly, people woke up on January 1st of 1921 sober, most of them. It was a quiet night, the New Year's Eve of 1920, going into 21. There were some revelers, I'm told, over at the Secor Hotel in Toledo at Jefferson and Superior. They had a big orchestra, had a big dance in the ballroom. There was a nice dinner of filet mignon and some mock turtle soup. Now, every chair had a note on it, and the note said it was a reminder that the Volstead Act, that was, the, of course, the federal act that made it illegal to in, imbibe or consume or sell liquors, had a reminder the Volstead Act was going to be enforced, and any man who had something stuffed in his hip pocket, it had just better be a handkerchief and not a hip flask full of hooch. Out at the Toledo Yacht Club, they also had a big party that night. It was a quiet party, a big dance. Everybody was out there. They said there was some guy in the orchestra started a rumor that somebody had a bottle of gin. Uh, everybody was looking for it and nobody seemed to be able to find it. Although I sort of suspect there were probably a lot of trips out to the parking lot to, uh, uh, to imbibe because while it might have been outlawed, it was not, you could still find it. And of course, the Windsor Toledo booze conveyor uh, that came down from Detroit, from the Detroit River and from Canada and eventually to Point Place and to, into Toledo, that was still in full swing. It was the uh, obvious confluence of American thirst and American enterprise that was taking place in 1921, even though it was a, a quiet New Year's Eve. Police say it was so quiet, there were only about a dozen arrests on that New Year's Eve going into 1921 in Toledo for drunk and disorderly conduct. They said normally they'd have 50 or 60 people arrested. The first new baby of the year in Toledo was recorded as Lawrence Jameson. He was 12 and a half pounds, born over at the East Side Hospital on Star Avenue. By the way, that building is still there. It's no longer a hospital, but it's still there. Uh, this young baby was, of course, a living reminder in the new year that 1921 was still in its infancy and nobody knew quite what that year would bring. Just like we didn't really know what 1920 or 2020 was gonna bring when we all started and we all know now what 2020 wrought. But 1920, a hundred years ago, wasn't the best year. There was an economic downturn. Lots of Toledo men were out of work. They were looking for work. 
25,000, according to Mayor, uh, Mayor Cornell Schreiber, were out of work, and it was uh, quite a problem. But even with that, there was still some hope. There was still some optimism uh, because there was some, they expected Toledo to continue growing. Some 15,000 new people were expected to move into the city in 1921. That's because there were still things happening in the economy here that were good. The, the Overland Company was, was running at full steam and the glass companies and, and a lot of the, uh, the steel mills along the river. Everything was still running actually pretty good. There was a little bit of optimism. They were hoping that uh, if you're an Ohio State fan, there was some optimism that, well, maybe Ohio State, the Buckeyes were gonna be able to bring home a win that first year of 19, the 1920s and 21, but it didn't happen. California beat them on New Year's Day at Pasadena in the Rose Bowl. The big problem that our grandparents were facing, and it would get bigger, was crime. Uh, crime was a big problem. In Toledo in 1920, they had 27 homicides. That's a lot. Last victim of the year was a lady by the name of Annie Mackle. She was shot and killed by a fellow by the name of Bruno Heydrich. Don't know exactly what happened. Some say it could have been a love triangle. She had another boyfriend. She was divorced. And anyway, he shot her over on Bush Street in North Toledo, then shot himself. Interestingly, uh, I read in the newspaper that uh, they both ended up in the same funeral home, uh, just in adjacent rooms. Uh, very few people went over to see Bruno. A lot of people, though, crowded in to see Annie, who was in her white gown lying in a tiny white casket, they said. The only person who didn't show up was her ex-husband, Eddie Mackle, who was a Toledo cop. And they said he didn't even go to the cemetery services at Calvary Cemetery. Some things never change. Always the young guys with too much time and a little too much testosterone. At the Happy Land pool room, there was a shooting in there a couple of days after New Year's. Proprietor Charlie Davis tried to get rid of a guy out of the place and the guy wouldn't leave. So Charlie pulled a revolver and well, the guy left feet first in a hearse. And that's the way things were done then. On Thursday, the 6th of January in 1921 in downtown Toledo, <clears throat> there was a stolen check <clears throat> a caper. Somebody tried to cash a stolen check on Madison Avenue downtown at a store. It resulted in a dramatic police chase, a shooting that left two people dead. This was in downtown Toledo. The check passer was a guy by the name of George Butler. As he tried to get away, he shot a good Samaritan and killed him. And then a policeman, <clears throat> excuse me, by the name of James King, he commandeered a car, stood on the running board, and and shot Butler in the head and, and killed him. So James King, uh, the newsbee anyway, said that it was probably, he was probably gonna be a hero because he was kind of an unlikely, he was, he was actually a school crossing guard who got to know the kids really well over at uh, Glenwood School at Detroit and Central. So he was, uh, they said he'd probably be a hero when the classes resume the next week. Over at the county jail, story of Clara Miller, uh, was talked about. She was starting her 12th year as the jail matron at the county jail. Uh, she was the jail matron for all the women prisoners that were behind bars. A Newsbee article featured her story, said she had personally conducted more and helped more than 5,000 women at the jail during her tenure there. She counseled them. Clara had cured, they said, 1,200 drug addicts and set straight a lot of women from what the Newsby called high-class female crooks, the shoplifters, foolish girls, and a few murderesses, all for 50 bucks a month. Said she spent many a night trying to cheer up a heart-sick girl who was gonna go on trial the next day. So many girls who learned life's bitter lessons at the jail and counseled by Mrs. Miller, since became law-abiding wives and mothers and named their girls that they might have had in the future. They named them Clara as a tribute to this wonderful woman who helped a lot of girls through a bad patch in life. One of the big concerns that police and our grandparents had in 1921, this first week of January, was dancing and the 
moral turpitude situation with dancing, making sure that when people dance in public, in public places and dance halls, they keep it decent. No cheek to cheek dancing. Keep your distance, be civil. They've got a new policewoman on the force, Mary Shaw, that's her job specifically, is to chaperone dances and keep young men and women from getting to be a little too familiar with each other. Mary says it's shocking and vulgar how these young people behave today. Said one woman wore a skirt recently that was above her knee halfway to her hip. Said the men were so disgusted by it they told her to leave the dance hall. She said, if that's not scandalous enough that some women are taking their corsets off in the restrooms, going back out to dance so they could get a little more freedom under their clothes as they danced. City council is going to hold hearings on that later this month. Now, if a couple didn't want to go dancing and they wanted to go to the movies, there's plenty of choices in the city. Back in 1921, downtown, 12 theaters by my count. Some live, remember they were all silent at this point. There was no sound talkies at this time. All silent movies, a little bit of vaudeville mixed in, some live theater as well. You had the Pantheon, you had the Rivoli, you had the Valentine. I know it dates me, but I remember them. Of course, the Valentine's been redone. There was the Empress Theater and the Temple and the Keith, that was a vaudeville theater, and the Alhambra just to name a few. And of course, if you went to the movies, you were probably gonna to try to find one that had Rudolph Valentino or Charlie Chaplin. For the well-dressed women who wanted to go out on the town, they had plenty of choices downtown. They had LaSalle's, they had Lampson's, they had the Lion's Store and, and Tidke's was around. And by the way, notice that that first week of January, LaSalle's had fur hats for the ladies made of mole skin and muskrat for five dollars. Now if you wanted to go a little more high class you could get and you didn't care about political correctness and I'm not sure they did back then, you could get coats made of raccoon, Australian possum, or bearing seal fur for $39.75. Well LaSalle's had another problem on their hands on uh, the fourth day of January in 1921 they had a riot well, sort of a riot out on Huron Street in front of the store developed when a woman who went shopping in the store left her baby in the buggy out on the sidewalk. And of course the baby woke up while mom's in the store. It created quite a confusion. People started gathering around trying to calm the baby. Then police got called to the scene. There was a gaggle of policemen and bystanders and they're all trying to figure out who belongs to this child. And they even called a paddy wagon because they were gonna take the child away. And, and generally well, they just weren't sure. So all of a sudden mom comes out and mom sees what's going on and mom starts screaming at everybody and carrying on in a, a, a sort of a righteous uh, outburst. And says she says, leave my baby alone. How could you do this to my child? And they left her alone and they just walked on down the street, according to the, according to the story. They said a couple of policemen made some snide comments and just kept walking. Toledo kept growing, as I said, forecast was for a lot of new people to move in. And so there, were, there was a lot of tension. A lot of things were changing. A lot of new groups were coming into the area and that that resulted in another big story that was happening that week that had happened earlier that year. And this was another story of a riot. The big story in January was, was Al Sherman. He was in Monroe, Michigan. He was a deputy and a farmer. He was a part-time deputy for the Monroe County Sheriff's Department. He was accused of killing two men in cold blood right after a church riot, uh, that's right, a church riot that had taken place in June. It was a church riot at the Methodist Church up at Ottawa Lake, where a, a rabid anti-Catholic evangelist by the name of Lewis King from Toledo was speaking in a packed crowd at this church shoot at this church, espousing his views about Catholic priests being evil and 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 weapons of Satan and da 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 da. Anyway, a large group of Catholic men did not take kindly to this and they showed up for Lewis King's uh, 
tent show that night up at the uh, Methodist Church in Ottawa Lake. And as you can well imagine, as Lewis King started uh, his invective against the Catholics, the Catholic men did not respond uh, nicely, and there were jeers, and there were threats, and there was yelling, and then all of a sudden everything in the pews went crazy, and um, there were fist, fisticuffs being thrown, and it basically turned into a violent uh, riot in the church. Uh, eventually spilled out into the parking lot, uh, Walter Gilday and Morris uh, Druliard, I think his name was, they were both two Catholic men who were there. They're just trying to get out of there. They got in their car, they're trying to leave to escape this riot, when all of a sudden they're shot dead by Deputy Al Sherman. Al Sherman is later charged with murder. He's just claiming that he was returning fire, that the men had been shooting at him. Uh, but there was no evidence ever that the men had any guns. But as the case went down that second week in January of 1921, Albert Sherman was acquitted and went back to his job as a, as a part-time farmer. This was also the week in Toledo that the city crews re-engineered Swan Creek. You know, if you go down Summit Street, it connects with, Summit Street continues to connect with Broadway. It didn't always do that. They had to re-engineer Swan Creek so they could put the make the bridge right so Summit Street could connect with Broadway and you could just go on from downtown down through South Toledo. And that was this was the week that it happened. They re-engineered it. Hundreds of people, they said, lined up on the banks of Swan Creek watching this engineering marvel. They said one contractor got so carried away with the the hubris of it all that he actually took brought a bottle of wine and smacked the bottle of wine on on the bridge and uh, they said the wine went on into into swan creek don't know how it affected the fish fishing was on the minds though of a lot of people in toledo that week weather had reached into the 40s and 50s children were out in the street without coats enjoying a false sense of spring uh, the warm weather also played havoc with mail delivery out on the lake. Apparently spawned a lot of thick fog. The small mail boats who deliver the mail out to the islands got caught up in that fog. One mail boat got lost for seven hours. Finally made it back to shore okay, but everybody was pretty worried for a while. The nice weather had everybody hopeful about the coming year. What was, what was 1921 going to bring? What would it bring? Well, you know, for baseball fans, hope springs eternal. Jim Thorpe if you recall that name, a famous Olympian. He was hired by the Toledo Mud Hens that first week of January. Owner Roger Bresnahan came up with the $1,500 to, to buy the famous Olympian in hopes that, well, that investment would help spark ticket sales and maybe help spark the team a little bit on to victory. Well, what did 1921 bring when it was all over? Well, in February, a gang of armed men held up the U.S. Post Office in downtown Toledo. Over a million dollars they took in securities, bonds, and cash. Biggest robbery in Toledo's history still is to this day. The Urbitis gang was responsible for this. Joe and Frank and Sister Wanda and a few other hangers-on and a cast of about 18 people when all was said and done, got involved in it, including a former priest from St. Hedwig's who was going to help launder some of that money. Apparently there was some sort of relationship between Wanda and the priest. And um, that's as much as I'm gonna say about that. Uh, they all, a lot of them turned state's evidence and a lot of people went to jail with the exception of the ringleader himself, Joe Urbitus, who managed to escape before his trial it wasn't found until about three years later in a big shootout with Columbus police down there. And they finally got him back for a big trial in Toledo. And he was eventually, uh, eventually convicted. He escaped again. And so they sent him on to Alcatraz where he, he served out his term to the mid forties. Uh, there was a big crime wave. The crime wave was so bad in 1921, by the way, when it was all said and done, there were 47 homicides in 1921, almost double the previous year. Tragically, seven of them policemen, five of them city officers from Toledo and two railroad detectives. 
There was a big crime wave in 1921. Crimes got to be so bad that Toledo passed an ordinance to rid the city of all known crooks, pickpockets, burglars, thieves, and swindlers. Anybody with a reputation for these activities, they didn't have to be convicted. If you just had a reputation, you were forced to leave the city. It was a new method of crime prevention, just move everybody out of the city that's even thinking about committing a crime. Not sure anybody cared about whether it was going to pass constitutional rigor, but that's what happened. And um, it didn't really turn out that well. Way As we said before, uh, 1921 ended up being an extremely violent year in the city of Toledo. The streets seemed to turn lawless overnight. Civil order broke down. Not just Toledo, but it was that way all over the country, nationwide. The nation, the nation was in a crime crisis by 1921 and 22. There was general disregard and a flaunting of the laws, probably somewhat uh, encouraged by prohibition. A lot of people just didn't want to, to were just going to pay attention to those laws, and they didn't. They kept the moonshiners and the rum runners busy trying to make some money, trying to sell the illegal booze. And of course, we know the stories of the gangsters and the Al Capone and the Licavolis and all of that that took place in Toledo through the 1920s and 30s, kept the dry agents busy trying to catch them. And every week there was another article in the paper about more stills and somebody being busted. And in fact, I noted in January of 1921, they even busted a couple of stills that were illegal stills set up in, the, in a couple of cemeteries over in East Toledo. And it wasn't just booze that was a problem in 1921, it was drugs too. A hundred years ago this week in Toledo, Benny Schinbach, also known as Fat Benny Schinbach, got caught with what police say was $28,000 in cocaine and morphine in a suitcase. That was a lot of, that was a lot of drugs back in 1921. Brought him over at 21st and Madison. Now, in politics, Warren Harding of Ohio would take his seat in the Oval Office, becoming the President of the United States. Harvey, Harding was well known in the Toledo area, had a big following here, so much so that Caswell Kennels of Toledo gave to Harding, right after he was inaugurated, they gave to Harding an Airedale Terrier that was born in Toledo. And this it was named Laddie Boy. And this Airedale Terrier became the first, first dog ever in the White House. Now, other presidents had dogs, but this one was sort of the official first dog. This one had many photos taken of himself in the front, on the lawn of the White House. This one had a seat at the, at the uh, table at the White House, at the dining table. Uh, <laughs> this dog was... Uh, the press paid great attention, would even do interviews with the dog. That's how popular Laddie Boy was. In fact, Laddie Boy turned out to be much more popular than Harding in the end. Had a bad heat wave that year in July. The temperatures got up to the 1990s. Every few days, somebody was dropping dead on the sidewalk downtown from heat prostration. A lemonade seller said he was selling a thousand glasses of lemonade every day, said he could have sold more. Heat was so bad, it caused tempers to flare. At Highland Park, a couple of rival youth gangs got into a big riot. Somebody got hurt. A couple of guys were taken to jail. Electric streetcars would finally go on to the streets. The electric streetcars now would go on to the streets of Toledo. That happened in February of 21 as the new community traction company would run the operation for many years until 1949. You might remember that name of that. I do, cert most certainly do. And of course, I remember those yellow and green buses they had on the streets of Toledo back before it all became TARDA in the 1970s. 1921, radio was just in its nascent infancy, just starting to be talked about. Uh, Detroit had a station, which later became WWJ. Toledo did not have a station, so the main and dominant news media in Toledo was as it had been for years. It was The Blade, The Times, and The Newsbee. And Interesting to note that whenever big news or sports events happened, people would gather around those newspaper offices and wait for the, for the newspapers to come out 
the very first editions because they would print five or six editions a day and they would bring that newspaper out and people would be crowded around reading the newspaper. It was kind of like how we got our breaking news back in the day, but it didn't last that long because by later in the 1920s, the future arrived. We had radio and then we got the news from radio and the world speeded up and we got news in many different ways. Of course, eventually it would lead to television. It would lead to electronic communication and, and radio would continue to be popular for a long time. And our information and ideas would spread very quickly. And the world seemed to go into hyperdrive by the 1920s. Transportation, of course, be, speeded up and came faster with airplanes and cars. Cars gave cars gave people a, a, a new freedom, a refuge. Young people got into cars and they could they could go places their parents didn't know they were. It just changed life dramatically in the 1920s. And of course, the it also helped the crooks and the bootleggers to have these vehicles as well. Talking movies would enter our modern life in the 1920s. We'd all get indoor plumbing and we'd get electricity in the rural areas. Areas in the 1920s basically would transform America and bring an awakening that has never stopped. And it all sort of was pivotal with 1921. 1921 was really a, a critical year. Albert Einstein won the Nobel Prize in physics that year. Adolf Hitler became the chancellor of the Nazi party in Germany. Later that year, the brown shirts, of course, in Germany would begin attacking his critics. The Communist Party was formed in China, also formed in a lot of other nations of Europe. That was 1921. The National Fascist Party was formed in Italy. Labor wars became and began to break out. First big labor war was down in the coal fields of West Virginia. Hundreds of people were killed down there. A Russian famine broke out in Russia, still a result from the Bolsheviks taking over and the end of World War I and uh, five million people died in that Russian famine. In Tulsa, the worst race riot in the history of this country took place in 1921, more than a hundred people died. In 1921, the Shepherd Towner Maternity and Infancy Act was formed. A lot of people don't probably remember that, uh, but it became law and it really marked the first time that our government got into socialism, if you will, or social security, because it provided for the first time, the federal government provided money, a million dollars every year for over five years with the purpose of aiding state run programs to help women and children. That was the first federal program we, we started. That was 1921. In many ways, 1921 was a year of seminal change, not just in Toledo, but around the world. And I guess in looking at it and reflecting on the things that have happened this week, you have to wonder, so what does it all mean? Besides the curiosity factor of things that happen, I guess for me, the lesson of history and maybe why I'm such a history nerd is that when I look at the worlds of the past and the present, what I see are things that are remarkably the same and remarkably different at the same time. Kind of like, you know, looking at a, at a childhood picture of adults that you may have known or ancestors from years ago, the old grainy black and white pictures from a long time ago. And you know, when you look at those pictures, and you probably do this too. You look at those people and you realize, you look in their eyes and you see the same look in their eyes. You recognize the same twist of a lip or the same shape of a head or the rise of a cheekbone and you realize, oh, I recognize myself in that or recognize somebody else. And you realize same, but different. And that's the way history can be. Especially when we looked at some of the pictures this week, those God awful images we saw that unfolded. I don't know about you, but I, I saw an ugliness that I've seen before whether in wars or lynch mobs, church riots or riots of any kinds and terror attacks. Same, but different. You know, Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself. At least he's reputed as saying that, but it does rhyme. 
and it does. Not only rhymes, but sometimes it echoes. And this week, or a hundred years ago, if you listen, it's still echoing. It's still repeating itself. Thank you. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail? At the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the closing as we take a look at history and we try to understand it I would just ask that everybody remember that the more we hold history in our hearts the more we value our past the more we hold on to it and understand it the less likely is it that somebody can rob our future Now, please join me in reading the words for extinguishing our chalice that can be found in the chat box. Because of those who came before, we are. For whatever their failings, we believe. Because of and despite the horizons of their visions, we too dream. Let us go remembering to praise, to live in the moment, to love mightily, and to always hold hope for the future. After service, we will turn on all videos and mics. Feel free to stay in Zoom and chat with your fellow MVC members and friends for our coffee hour. Um, Lou may also be able to stay and answer some questions too. Um, please be patient. It takes a few minutes to turn on uh, everybody's mics and cameras. And now for our closing song, uh, we're very excited to have uh, Lynn um, sing Go With a Song in Your Heart, something that uh, Lynn and Steve uh, put together recently and um, want to thank you for them for, for doing that. I think it, I think you'll enjoy it. So here we go. Go with the song in your heart. Go with music in your soul. Leave with the memory of a melody. Go with the song in your heart.
that is the end of our service, but again, please stay for our coffee hour and thank you for joining us today. <laughs>